It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Conversations with Joan focuses on topics that are important to your life, from health and wellness to professional development to personal well-being. Change makers join me to share their insights, tips, and strategies so you can thrive and live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. Now, let's start talking. A new human consciousness is emerging. According to today's guest, Gary Zukov, humanity based on love instead of fear is upon us, but only we can bring it into being. Gary joins us today to talk about how we can transform experiences of hopelessness, emptiness, and pain into fulfillment, meaning, and joy. Gary has inspired millions to realize their soul's greatest potential. He is the author of the legendary number one New York Times bestseller, The Seed of the Soul, and co-founder of the Seed of the Soul Institute. Gary's new book is Universal Human, Creating Authentic Power and the New Consciousness. Welcome, Gary. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure, Joan. I'm glad to be here. Well, Gary, for me, it really is an honor to have you here because your work has had an impact on my life and it's helped me navigate challenges that I faced. And, you know, I know it's done that for millions of people around the world. The Seed of the Soul was such a groundbreaking book, and it it touched so many lives. And from the time when you first wrote that book, through all the lectures and and all the other work that you've done, what changes have you seen in people? Well, I have seen so many changes of such depth and power and clarity and love that I'm awed. I'm I'm awed at who we are as humans. I'm awed, awed at our capability and what I want to suggest to people is that now those capabilities have changed dramatically. A new phase of human consciousness and this transformation is species-wide. It's not happening all at once, but it's happening very fast from an evolutionary point of view. Within, in my experience, within uh, two or three generations, all humans will have this new consciousness. And it's not mystical. It's simply expanding. It's a consciousness that allows us to perceive beyond the limitations of the five senses, to look at ourselves as more than bodies and minds, and the world as more than random, and the universe is more than inert and the product of a big bang, whatever that is. We're in the midst of global challenges, the likes of which most have never experienced before. I mean, the year that we're all coming off of and all that we've gone through. And you say that we can transform these painful experiences into something joyful and positive when we know how to use them. So how does what you're telling us, how does what you're teaching play into that? How do we go about doing that? That is the same as the question, how do I create authentic power? It's only possible to create authentic power, well, first of all, to understand what it is. Mm -hmm. The old understanding of power is the ability to manipulate and control. That's what we've used as a species for 300,000 years, or maybe 2.5 million years, depending upon where the count starts. But it's all counterproductive now. It used to be our good medicine, and now it's poison. It's toxic. It produces only violence and destruction. That's part of the new consciousness. The new understanding and experience of power is the alignment of your personality with your soul. And your soul is that part of you that intends to create harmony and cooperation and sharing and reverence for life. It's the part of you that doesn't die when you die. It's the part that existed before you were born. And now real power comes from aligning yourself with that. How do you do it? That was the question you asked. You do it by finding all of the parts of your personality that prevent that from happening, which means prevents you from loving, which means prevents you from giving the gifts that you were born to give. Let me give you a few samples or examples of those parts of your personality. Anger, resentment, inferiority, superiority, rage, vengeance, 
righteousness, every compulsive activity and obsessive thought and addictive behavior. All of these come from parts of your personality that prevents you from aligning your personality with your soul, that prevents you from giving the gifts you were born to give. Now, all of this is part of the new consciousness that we're talking about because this conversation would not have made any sense to my parents, maybe even not to your parents. But now it's beginning to make sense to hundreds of millions of people. So to create authentic power requires emotional awareness, which tells you when fear is active. And all of those behaviors and experiences that I mentioned, we can put into one basket. And for convenience, we'll call it fear. And we can put all of your other kinds of experience experiences in another basket. Experience such as gratitude, appreciation, caring, contentment, patience, all of the universe. We can put all of those into a category and call it love. Now, the big thing that the new consciousness allows you to see is that when you have any of these experiences, although it may, may feel like it at the time, these experiences are not coming from the unchangeable ground of your being. When you're angry, I read in your bio, uh, Joan, about the loss of uh, important members in, of, of your family and about all that followed that. Everyone experiences that kind of grief and pain and loss and hopelessness and despair that follows it. But what most people don't know, and they can know now, and they may be resonating with what I and you are saying, is that experiences like that that seem to be all enveloping, all encapsulating, like grief, loss, despair, hopelessness, helplessness, those come from a part or a or parts of your personality. And you have other parts of your personality as well. And as you remember that and set your intention to remember that, when you feel despair or rage or anger or righteousness, you can, in that moment while you're feeling these frightened parts of your personality, reach for the healthiest part of your personality that you can in that moment. Think of a time when you felt, you felt so grateful, maybe for your life, maybe for someone in your life, not for what that person could give to you or has given to you, but because they exist in the world. And you are so grateful for that. Reach for that while you're feeling anger or jealousy or resentment or superiority or inferiority. Choose not to be controlled by that part of your personality. That's creating authentic power. Moving beyond the control of the destructive, painful parts of your personality. And that's where emotional awareness comes in. You had mentioned what I experienced in my life, and, and really the work I'm doing now, Gary, was the result of that because in, in six months, my 23-year marriage ended, my mother died, my sister died, and my son left for school. So the identity I had no longer existed. And in that dark place, I mean, you, you talk about a transformation. I, it was almost like I had to be knocked to my knees to awaken and, and I'm not sure I would have grown the way I have without that pain. Is it possible for us to awaken, to, to be part of this new consciousness without having that type of, of suffering in our life? It, it's not necessary to wait for that kind of experience, but it is necessary for you or for me or for anyone who's listening, if you want to change, to experience your emotions. You cannot grow spiritually without your heart. You cannot deny or repress or suppress or try to pretend that your emotions are not happening to you and grow spiritually because your emotions carry messages. You might say they're messages from your soul. They tell you when fear is active in you and when love is active in you. It's easy to tell when fear is active in you because it hurts. You hurt. You hurt in specific places in your body. In the East, these places are called chakras. But since I don't speak Sanskrit, I prefer to call them energy processing centers. And there's one at the crown of your head and in your temple area and between your forehead, on your forehead between your eyes and in your throat, in your chest area, in your solar plexus area, in your genital area, and the very base of your torso. Whenever you are experiencing a frightened part of your personality, 
or you might want to call it a fear-based part of your personality. You, you experience physical pain in those areas. And I'm not talking about pain like you can say, it's, I feel happy or I feel constricted or I feel heavy. Those are just poetic labels. I'm talking about physical sensations, churning, burning, stabbing, contracting, aching, throbbing. When you are aware of fear active in you and you are able to articulate it in terms of of the physical sensations in these parts of your body, then you're on your road to the spiritual path. And when love is present in you, it feels good. You don't have painful physical sensations. They're blissful. They're good-feeling physical sensations. And your thoughts, instead of how can I live without her, how can I live without him, everything is lost, I'm hopeless, I'm helpless, you are experiencing thoughts of gratitude and appreciation and caring and all of the universe. And creating authentic power is conceptually simple. You choose between allowing yourself to be controlled by the frightened parts or continue to indulge in them, which is the same thing, or you strive in that moment of pain and helplessness and hopelessness to bring your awareness to the healthiest part of your personality you can in the moment. Because where your attention goes, you go. And as you do that, you create authentic power. Not the first time, although that could happen. But if your growth is incremental, (laughs) like mine has been, Mm -hmm. as you do it again and again and again and again, you begin to move beyond the control of those parts of your personality. You know them very well, but they don't. They don't command you as they did at one time. It's more like water running off the feathers of a duck. And so now you're asking, you ask, is it possible for someone to grow spiritually without having the kind of experience that you had? And the answer is yes. What you had is the most worn, the well-worn path to that kind of experience that, as you said, knocks you to your knees. But to grow spiritually, it's necessary to experience all of your emotions, all of your emotions. And as you begin to become emotionally aware, the first emotions that you experience are fear, right. because that is what most of us experience and are controlled by all of our lives. This is all part of the new consciousness. This is why I'm so excited about it and so pleased that you invited me to share these observations. And by the way, as I share, I, I will say that my spiritual partner, Linda, and by the way, a spiritual partner is not just a dyadic relationship. It's not romantic. As uh, As I share, and as we share in our events, and as I will share in my podcast, I don't ask you or anyone to take what I'm saying as true simply because I say it. And in fact, I suggest that you not take as true what anyone says simply because they say it, whether they're saying it from a pulpit or they're on a television show or a radio show or they have a microphone. Experiment with it. See what you feel about it. If you resonate with it, take it in. See if it can help you uh, move in the direction that you want to grow toward more awareness and freedom from fear and into love. And if it doesn't, let it go. Don't don't try to wear a shoe that pinches. There's lots of ways to wisdom, to the heart, and that diversity of ways is one of my joys. But this is a way that I like to share as a window through which I've come to see life. And I hope that is helpful for you as well. Gary, what in your life led you to understand what you've been teaching to us for years? Well, that's a good question. The universe was my teacher, and it was always teaching me. I paid much attention to it. For example, I know now that we're more than minds and bodies. I know that the world is symbolic. It's meaningful. It tells me about myself, not just about the world. My sense is the world teaches us about the world. I wrote a book on physics, for example. Our observations of the world show us that the speed of light in a vacuum is 186,222 miles per second. An amazing fact, an amazing discovery, but it's not about ourselves. The new consciousness sees the world, the physical world, as instructing us about ourselves. Sees it as a mirror, you might say, facing always toward us. And we can learn from the reflection in that mirror. So... Let me give you a specific example. When I was just a 
when I, I was still in Harvard and I was coming back to Kansas to be uh, with, I, I would come back to Kansas to be with my grandmother and I loved her a lot. And we had the greatest times together. But the last time I came back to Kansas to be with her was for her funeral. And it was devastating to my parents. But for me, I had this different experience. I was in a funeral home, and the rabbi was speaking to the people assembled who were in front of him. But we and the family were in an alcove off to his right. And I was looking at a closed-circuit television monitor showing him as he appeared to the people in front of him. But I was looking at him from the side. Now, in those days, a closed-circuit television monitor was completely novel. You know, very few people had seen him. I was for the first time, and it made me laugh. Now, let me give you a little backstory. When I would come to visit my grandmother, she lived in this apartment building that was mostly for older people. I don't think it was a retirement home, but it might as well have been. And she would take me to have a dinner in the restaurant there. And it was a lovely restaurant, a big one. And afterwards, we would wander through the lo- through the lobby, and she's holding my hand, and she'd introduce me. And she'd say, Gary, you remember Mrs. Hirsch? And I'd nod. Or you remember Mr. Goldstein? And I'd nod, even if I hadn't. But mm-hmm. if I didn't nod, she would jerk my hand down, and she'd say, well, there I was at her funeral. <laughs> And she jerked my hand down, as she said, when I started to laugh. She wanted to enjoy and listen to her funeral. I never told they would think that I was hallucinating, but I wasn't. Grandma Libby was right there with me, the way she always had been. She even jerked my hand down and hushed me, the way she always had. But I didn't realize this. I didn't realize this, Joan, at the time. It was decades later before I realized that's multisensory perception or a part of it. And the rest of it started to come down. I won't say like an avalanche, but it started to rain when I was writing The Dancing Wooly Masters. I was invited to a meeting of physicists at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. And they were some of the finest theoretical physicists in the world. And I was excited because I could understand what they were saying. They were not speaking in mathematical terms, but in qualitative terms. And I went home so excited, so Stimulated, I felt like I had three cups of cappuccino and they were all, all of that was sparking off my fingertips. But I couldn't describe to anybody what was exciting me. I could not replicate it. I could not articulate it. So I went back. Uh, I asked if I could come and they were very gracious and, and gave me that permission. And I decided that I wanted to write a book to give what I was learning about quantum physics to everyone, to non-physicists like me, the liberal arts majors like me, on a golden platter, and I did. I went back and I went back. I started to read and read and read, and then I started to write, and then I asked the physicists at this gathering if they would help me with the book, and they said they would, all except one. It was amazing. And to me, their generosity was amazing. And they only asked me one thing. In fact, they demanded it get it right, get it factually, historically, and conceptually accurate. And so I would write a page on my old Smith Corona typewriter. They Mm -hmm. weren't all old, and I'd send it to them, and they'd send me a page or maybe two pages back, and I would incorporate that into the book in different ways. In this process, as I started to write the book, I wrote an outline for each chapter. But when I started to write, immediately, the energy, my energy, my thoughts, my passion, my excitement went somewhere else. (laughs) The the outline was not holding it anymore. I threw away the outline. I went with the energy. I just wrote what came to me, what was inspiring to me, what I saw, what was stimulating me as I learned this thing called quantum mechanics without any mathematics. And that's how I was able to share it. Now, in about six months... I noticed these chapters were fitting together, so I planned it. But I didn't plan it. I disposed with all of the outlines. So how was that happening? How could it be happening? That's when I realized. That's when I experienced. I'm not writing this alone. Then I realized it's not possible to be alone. I'm not a channel. It's not possible for anyone to be alone. Therefore, it's not possible to co-create alone. 
And I decided, whatever it is that I'm in touch with, I am going to live my life with more of that. I'm going to live my life the way this book is being written, spontaneously. Ten years later, I was writing another book called Physics and Consciousness. And, and I realized this is, and I had a lot written, and it was good, but it came from my eyebrows upward. That was its origin. And I felt something deeper and richer that I wanted to write about. And that book became The Seat of the Soul, about mm -hmm. evolution, reincarnation, the earth school, non-physical guides and non-physical teachers, the heart. And that is the book that really for me was the beginning of the full emergence of non-physical reality in my life. And that's when I realized, or I was taught, I began to be taught, that this is happening to hundreds of millions of people. And those are the people that I want to support. I want to support everyone. But someone who's still five century will not have in their experience anything that they can use to hook on to what I'm saying or what we're talking about. But it's real. Everyone eventually will be multi-sensory. And the fact that we are multi-sensory does not make us superior in any way to someone who's five sensory. It's just a temporary ebb and flow in evolution. We are part of a magnificent evolution and we are becoming aware of it as it happens. We're becoming aware with our new consciousness that we are creating our evolution. That's some big news. Gary's new book is Universal Human, Creating Authentic Power and the New Consciousness. If you'd like to get more information about Gary and his work, you can visit GaryZukoff.com. Gary, in our final moments, in about 30 seconds or less, what's the takeaway? What would you like to leave our listeners with? I would like to suggest you consider the possibility that you are a compassionate and loving, powerful, and creative spirit. That your origins are not only biological, that your creative capacity is far beyond what you can imagine. That you have a purpose in your life, a gift to give, a sacred contract with the universe. There is nothing pre-written in the universe. There is no destiny. You're not burdened by that. There is potential. There is no right and no wrong. There is cause and effect, and you cannot separate them. If you are part of the cause, you will experience the effect and be part of it. Make the cause a loving intention. Make your words contributory. Make your joy evident to the world. Share it without attachment to the outcome and enjoy yourself. Gary, thank you for spending this time with us. I am excited to share your book with our listeners. And as I said in the introduction, I'm honored that you're spending this time with us today. So thank you so much for being here. Well, you're welcome, Joan. Oh, it's a joy, Joan. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. I hope you found the show informative. At Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life, we believe that knowledge is power. Take what you've learned, apply it, and live your best life now. Remember that the information provided is the opinion of our guest and should never replace the advice of a professional who knows your personal situation. If you'd like more information, visit our website, cyacyl.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on our site, listen to past shows on demand, read the digital magazine, sign up for our mailing list, and be sure to follow the show on social media. Until next time, this is Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in.